What I'm trying, going to try to do is really raise the questions of the nature of the, the transition. And as I said yesterday, it was Trotsky who, re, who defined the present period as the transitional epoch. I didn't go on to discuss what that, that exactly meant, obviously. He, he was referring to, of course, the period where the Russian Revolution had taken place and therefore the issue of socialism had been placed on the agenda. The bourgeoisie had been warned that they could be overthrown and had been overthrown in one place, but not totally. So in this period, it was a period in which the working class had still to take power over the globe effectively had still to take power as a whole, but it had made its mark and by taking power in one country it had begun a period of change, or the period of change, the necessary period of change. Of course, <clears throat> socialism doesn't take place, doesn't come about simply through a revolution. If that was all it is, it would have taken place or would never take place. As we all know, socialism comes into being because the basis of it is already exists within capitalism and is coming into being. In other words, the socialization of the means of production of the society takes place with, within capitalism. Logically, one could get to a point where it, the society was so socialized, although nominally capitalist, it would be very easy to change it. You wouldn't even need what we call a revolution. But that is not true today. And no one would want to wait until that time because one would expect a whole series of unwelcome activities including, as people have implied yesterday, a series of wars. Millions more might well die. So that's not the option, and no socialist has ever put that as an option. <coughs> Hence, we've had a revolution, but we haven't taken power. And that's the period we actually live in. The problem hasn't been easy to deal with. Whether it's in the taking of power or simply in terms of supporting institutions which we regard as more left wing. In a capitalist society, a co op malfunctions. State enterprises, by and large, malfunction. It's inevitable that that is the case. Say malfunctioning compared with what they could do, and very often malfunctioning in comparison with the, with the market itself. It's very hard for the future system to compete with the old system under conditions where it cannot exercise itself to the full. It's in fact impossible. On the other hand, what we have is a series of institutions, state institutions, nationalized entities, and attempts to be semi-market with, with co-ops and various other enterprises which are undertaken by um, what can one call them? good-minded people. If you look at the Mandogon co-op in Spain, it's hard to say that it has succeeded. Obviously the people who support it think it's, may well think it's wonderful, but the fact is it hasn't really been able to go very far and it had to be bailed out. It's true of co-ops in general. Marx was well aware of the contradictory situation. It's in, it is, in fact, impossible to set up a nationalized enterprise 
which would have all the facilities which it could have in a truly socialized enterprise. It is not going to happen that you're going to have a nationalized enterprise within capitalism where workers elect the manager. That just won't happen. You can't have control from below. It isn't allowed. That it will not it will not come into being. Under those conditions where in fact workers remain exploited and oppressed as they are in the capitalist enterprise and yet don't have for a few the advantages that they would have if they were in the market enterprise, it's in inevitable that it malfunctions up to a point. Nationalized enterprises have certain advantages in, in any case, but they tend therefore to be offset in the way I've just said. It's true that today most people in Britain would like the railways to be renationalized. But <clears throat> under National Rail there were numerous defects which everybody knows. I certainly couldn't travel by train from uh, from Scotland down, down to London without coming out uh, at the, the other end quite ill. It may just be me, but <laughs> that was the case. It's true, in some ways it's much worse than that. You should take a train. I mean, every time I take a train, maybe just me, every time I take a train from Edinburgh down to London, the train comes so late I miss everything. It's happened every time I've done I, I, I don't take trains. <laughs> Well, it's in the nature of the thing that you can't mix them. You, you can't have market socialism, in other words. Market socialism is a, is a nonsense. Now, you might know that I had a debate with a number of people. It's, it's in a book uh, called Market Socialism, which to my surprise actually did sell. With, um, two people in the United States with, and myself and Bertel Ullman arguing that market socialism couldn't work, wouldn't work and wouldn't be. Uh, perhaps it's not surprising it was translated into Chinese. <laughs> I'm not very clear with the Chinese elite who got out of that. Anyway, the point is, of course, that the, the nature of the enterprises are totally opposed. Socialism, as I said, <coughs> starts, to use the word uh, in a very general sense, from a far more democratic uh, beginning and capitalism. And capitalism's idea of, the, of that word basically means that they, they have something which they can control while pretending that they can call it a democratic form. Clearly what we have, the so-called democratic forms, have very little, very little in common with control from below which of course raises a whole question as, how, as to how one can actually deal with that. The question being that you can then say we must be more democratic, but if you are more democratic you're very likely to lose much faster than you would have done otherwise within the capitalist framework. It's not surprising that the Bolsheviks took the route they, that they did within capitalism. In the end, what we're arguing for is the fullest possible control from below, and you could call it the fullest form of democracy, but in fact it goes far beyond it. The problem is how, how to deal with that situation. I, I don't have an answer, I'm, I'm raising the question and putting the dilemma and the problem and pointing out that it's necessary to make the point at all times. So, when, when arguing with market socialists like, like the Labour Party, one has to argue that with them. 
that they wrong to attack what, whatever they are attacking, <coughs> whatever example they're attacking. Um, say council housing and argue that one has to have market housing and in, the, on the, in the simplistic form which they do. They have to, it has to be explained why it is what it is at this particular stage. There's no, no doubt of course that you, if you live in a council house you have tremendous trouble and that in many respects it's far better to have your own house, quite obviously. On the other hand, you're very likely not to have your own house. You can't afford it. So, <clears throat> one has to be able to argue against them in those terms, and not in the kind of terms which are actually used at, at, the, at the moment. You know, as socialism is, as it were, whole and indivisible. And it is necessarily the case, therefore, that the Labour Party will always lose in the end. Because it's not possible to have market socialism. It cannot work, except for very short periods of time under very special conditions such as existed from 45 to 70 or so, at which point, of course, effectively the population was calling a halt and saying we have to go further. That is a necessary result. There's no other way it could actually go. The bourgeoisie has actually realized that. That's why we're in the crisis where, which we are in. They aren't going to concede any further, and they're not going to go that way again. In a sense, the right of the Labour Party uh, belong to another era, except, of course, it's quite obvious that they don't understand it. If they had any sense, they would simply pack up and go home. Whether they win or lose, they, they really have no future, except as a, as a Conservative Party number two. Anyway, <clears throat> this has been a cross which the left has borne for a long time, and it doesn't really have to. It should be able to reply very directly as to why the nationalised forms malfunction, one can go into detail as to why that is the case. And <clears throat> it isn't enough to have a nationalised form, we have to go further. And I see, in fact, Corbyn does often do so. The same applies once taking power. And of course that's what happened to, to the Soviet Union itself. Whereas in the Soviet Union they nationalised everything after June, July 1918 and uh, Priya Vigencia and Lord Carver wrote that book arguing the case for total control, total nationalization. By 1921 they, they retreated and reintroduced the market. It's quite obvious that you can't make the jump in one go. It's clear that you have to have a large level of automation before you can get there. You can't have a section of the workforce who are semi-skilled or unskilled, even if you pay them twice as much as the uh, richest person, as it were. <clears throat> you can't have that. You have to have a, a situation where the population as a whole is highly educated. You have to have a situation where people work because work has become their prime want, as uh, Marx defines socialism. Even if you haven't quite got there, it, w it would achieve the, the object. And of course, to a large degree, we, in principle, we could be there. Because there, there are enough people who are in a situation where they are working because they want to work. In terms of the socialization uh, argument, it's clear in the case of education and health that doctors, nurses often work, have to work not just on the basis of money, but because they think that they're doing something for humanity and in so doing helping themselves. That already exists. 
And of course, it's being extended within society as society becomes more and more socialized. As I said, <coughs> one could project it forward and, and say we, we will get there simply even under capitalism. The trouble is, the, the nature of capitalism is such is quite likely to have a series of wars, famines, chaotic uh, entities, etc. So enough people will <coughs> suffer or die before you actually get there. So we can't wait until that time. But it's already in process. That is the nature of uh, the development of capitalism and the argument against capitalism in the end. That is an outdated form, the new forms of which are coming into being. <clears throat> I've argued a, a number of times um, to the I don't know if it's the same people, but the last 20 or one was whatever the years in this uh, forum in terms of decline. And uh, <clears throat> I know uh, Ben is working on the subject. <clears throat> I don't know if, uh, how much I should go in detail on this. Talking of decline and declining capitalism, what we're talking about, of course, is, as I've just said, a rising socialization of the society. In the first instance, if a social system is in decline, its fundamental law must be in decline. Otherwise, it isn't in decline. So, in other words, we're talking about the law of value being in decline, malfunctioning and the process of being replaced. And of course saying the same thing in other words as to what, uh, uh, in terms of what I've already said. Well, much of what I've said <clears throat> applies to what's happening to the law of value. Quite obviously the law of value cannot apply except in a, uh, in a skewed and absurd way in education and health. And we can see it today with the absurdities of the Tory government imposing what they are imposing on the National Health Service and, and, on, uh, and on schools. The, the same thing applies increasingly in the, in the rest of the economy. Even if ostensibly what you've, what you've got is apparently prices. The question isn't whether they're just a price, but whether it does reflect value. The bourgeoisie, of course, realized this and deliberately set out to see to it that as much as possible could be privatized and subject to the law of value. They're well aware of the way in which there has been this uh, change in, in uh, society. But in fact, it's impossible to do it. And what they've done, they produce a caricature to a very large extent. And the, the ultimate, not the ultimate, but one of the uh, indicators is precisely the crisis that we're in, from which they cannot deliver themselves, which we discussed yesterday. Quite clearly, when the only ways in which capitalism can survive on the basis of either war or imperialism, which was the case in 1914 and, and later, it's already given up the ghost, as it were. But that is its, that is its nature. That does reflect, of course, its own decline. It's not able to maintain itself without going into a crisis. And as I was arguing yesterday, it is isn't a crisis for which there appears to be no end, except socialism. Secondly, <clears throat> one could go and argue the different forms, discuss the different forms of the law of value, which are, are more limited. Secondly, and uh, really <clears throat> what I might have made first, it's clear that And, uh, capitalism's productivity is below what potentially socialism could produce. 
One might argue that with somebody who's on the right. But it's not difficult to show it, that if you had a society in which the control from below, almost certainly productivity would be a lot higher than, than today. When you have society, I mean, the different parts of production, the different people in production, the different uh, ranks in production, classes in production, are fighting one another, you are bound to have a lower productivity than when it is not the case. Productivity is below what it would be under socialism. And people are working because they enjoy their work, want their work, want to help society, and don't need m money in order to work. It's clear that productivity would be much higher. It's hard to argue anything, uh, anything else. You can't argue some sort of absolute in terms of decline, that uh, capitalism uh, somehow is producing less than an unknown something else in any absolute terms. I'm arguing it in relative terms, in other words. That the potential is there and cannot express itself. It's not hard, of course, to show that, uh, show what I've just said. It's fairly obvious. And of course, under conditions when they're when there is one crisis after another, one war after another, and one then looks at total produced, over a period of time it's, uh, it, it, there is no contest that a society which was peaceful, which wasn't imperialist, would have much higher level of, of production over, over that period. So the, the argument is proven, as it were, automatically. But it, it's it's not just in terms of history that this, uh, that this applies. If you remember, it's Marx who argues that the justification for capitalism, and he goes into a pian of praise for capitalism, is precisely that it raises productivity to the level where socialism becomes possible. Marx says so explicitly. That is, it is the justification for capitalism. Even though capitalism is what it is and is what it was when he was writing. <clears throat> With people dying early, child labor, and, and all the rest. Even with all that, capitalism performed the service in reaching a point where socialism became possible. Of course, it's saying that mankind, humanity, had to go through a whole series of stages which were, in effect, inhuman in order to get to socialism. But it has reached that point. And hence, one can say in relation to, <coughs> in relation to the, the future, in relation to socialism, it is in decline. The last point which I use for the question of decline is the fact that in dialectical terms the contradictions in the society are not able to be solved. I'll put, the matter, I'll put it in direct terms. The point about a contradiction as used in Marxism or Hegelism is that the poles interpenetrate and lead to a supersession. What's happening is the poles are not interpenetrating, they are conflicting. We, we therefore get crises, crisis after crisis, which would be a classic example of, <coughs> of a society which had to be superseded but cannot be superseded at, at a particular time. What we are getting is the gradual replacement of market operations with proto-planning forms. Now the Soviet Union doesn't exist, the, our government, if, if, if you recall, started using words which otherwise didn't want to, like planning. Remember Osborne's long-term economic plan? 
at, at Glasgow University they abolished that part of the planning in the earlier period on the grounds that planning couldn't be accepted. It's the wrong word. So planning's come back. But of course it is true that within the existing society, which is partly what I was saying before, that we have planned forms. They but they're not they're not planning in the way that we fully un the way we understand the way it must come in the end from below, as again Marx defines it in the first chapter of Capital. <coughs> it's it's proto planning. So up to a point it works, but only up to a point. It takes a form of <coughs> regulation planned, so-called planned infrastructure development, they're quite prepared to, to do that again up to a point that at the moment they're of course in tremendous trouble because the uh, IMF wants mass infrastructure investment and they just won't do it, except in the case of HS2 which seems to be a hopeless enterprise. And of course they have long-term conscious projections for their market operations and socially orientated forms. So it, it, it is changing and um, yesterday I pointed out uh, something which many people have uh, that the, uh, the nature of production itself the nature of society has changed to being much more long term takes much longer to get many things produced or, or underway. Even the construction of factories can often take a very long time. Of course, it does. if you simply want to put up a shed, it doesn't take very long. Or you want to put up another example of Tesco, then it will take a few minutes. So, but that's very different from putting up a new engineering plant. And it's certainly true that in terms of the pharmaceuticals, which of course now are one of the few major British industries, it takes an enormous amount of time, an enormous amount of, of investment. So that it really does have to be costed and in fact um, proto plan or plan over long periods. Which is different from operating on simply the basis of profit. And hence the state is often and usually, and I quoted it yesterday, usually involved today. So <clears throat> the simple market doesn't operate by itself in spite of the attempt of the bourgeoisie to switch to the market by itself. It hasn't actually happened, that cannot happen. And is less likely to happen in future. It was Priyabrzhensky who uh, put forward the concept that we were in an epoch, and he was from the Soviet Union, of course, an epoch, an <coughs> epoch of a transitional period in which there was conflict going on between planning and, 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 and the market. He was referring to the Soviet Union, of course, at that time. But what I'm saying here is that, in fact, this applies to the whole world today. Although this uh, no a Bolshevik party planning the world. This is what is happening in any case. If one has a, uh, to uh, go further on the question of decline, if one has a, a, a concept of decline, it's quite a profound concept to think out not just what it means theoretically <coughs> for the present time, but what it means in general. It actually alters your conception of history because the, the implication isn't just that there's a period of decline. The implications, of course, Marx makes explicit in, the, in his famous uh, preface is <clears throat> that there is then an embryonic phase, or coming into B phase, and a mature phase. That changes your understanding of capitalism itself. It will necessarily change it. Because you can't simply generalize from what amounts to the 12th century to the, to the present. You have to say certain features which were in the 12th century are part of an initial capitalism, but they are not part of the present day capitalism. 
The same will apply to, the, to uh, let's say, to the founding of the Bank of England. And that is before mature capitalism comes into being. One can't simply generalize from what happened at that point to the present. In general, uh, what one has to say is that uh, Marxism bases itself not on simple generalizations, of course, but in look, looking at the process of movement and the crucial reason for that movement. It's not that one can't have generalizations, but you have to have the generalizations in a very specific manner. And one can't make a simple generalization across one point in capitalism to another point in capitalism. You have to ask what stage was it? That's not the only question you have to ask, but you really do have to ask what, what stage was it that this phenomenon occurred. When Henry VIII was expropriating the monasteries, that wasn't a developed capitalism. It wasn't a mature capitalism, it wasn't a declining capitalism. So one can't simply generalize from that point. One has to ask what that meant, where, and where, where it was going, and whether and that was the only way it could go and compare it with elsewhere where it actually happened. You can't simply compare it just to uh, some country today taking over monasteries. I say this because people tend, tend to do that. Many of the histories that have been written do that, do precisely that. Just say, well, capitalism began at point A, and we are now at point B, so we just look at the whole period and come to some sort of conclusion. If you do that, you may do something worthwhile and you may talk absolute nonsense. You have to be very clear what you're actually doing. Generalization, just like that, can't be done if you take a Marxist viewpoint. You have to look, as I said, at what is crucial in movement and what is the contradiction involved. The same, of course, applies over history in general. And for that reason, much of the history written by uh, people who were uh, uh, in the Communist Party is very interesting, but uh, some distance from Marxism. <clears throat> it's very useful em empirically, but they don't ask the kind of questions that they ought to be asking. And of course, <clears throat> It therefore applies even more strongly to the present day. And what's happening today, what was happening as were well yesterday in the mature phase of capitalism, comparing the mature phase to the present phase and comparing the decline, as it were, in itself to a period of transition when capitalism has actually been overthrown. They're not identical. The changes which have occurred are important. One must be able to see what they are when looking at what existed before. Much of what's written loses that perspective and while it's be interesting to read it, people may be very sincere, but the end result is you don't learn very much from uh, this ki a kind of uh, all-embracing uh, coverage. One wants to be very careful what one's actually saying. I'm not saying that I managed to, to do any of this very well or do anything well. I'm not uh, trying to buttress my reputation if I've even got one. So, I'm simply making a point which I think follows from a theory of decline. The theory of decline is complex in itself. And it's not, it's not uh, as it were, a, 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 an automatic uh, consequence of uh, learning political economy or, for that matter, learning uh, history. In this, uh, just moving on, what I've, the first point I've made, I've got eight points, so I'm, uh, I'm only going to get through two or three. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> moving on. <clears throat> Uh, in this period, and we've seen the rise of what we call a bureaucratic apparatus. Now it seems to be specific to this period. Of course, it's not in fact, though what, it's not clear how one can compare it, but it's clear that in the decline of, of the old mode of production, 
and the coming and being of capitalism, a bureaucratic apparatus also came to be. That's to say, a large state came to being, and a bureaucratic apparatus under it came into being. We all know that as feudalism was declining, it was replaced by the king and the uh, absolutism that went with it, and the, and the bureaucratic apparatus that went, and then later the bureaucracy takes power and it changes. So it would appear that uh, bureaucratic apparatus doesn't only come about with the decline of capitalism. Well, that's not exactly surprising. We don't have to go into the history of capitalism, why that actually happened, and it's discussed by Marx in some detail, which you got from Ferguson. Uh, <clears throat> the point, though, is that given the decline of capitalism and the coming into being of socialism, we have an increased degree of bureaucratic apparatus. And we've seen it, of course, in the case of the Soviet Union in an extreme form, but it, it exists throughout the world today. It exists not just in, in the state, but it exists in major enterprises extensively. The discussion by Weber is absolute nonsense. I don't know why anybody ever reads Weber, who is on the left. That is, you expect the other side to read Weber. Because what, <coughs> what Weber basically does is simply say we have official, it exists uh, in a hi hierarchical form, they follow rules and all the rest. Well, up to a point that uh, in a purely superficial way you can say that. But it's really irrelevant. Of course, he completely leaves out class society and therefore the importance of class in relation to what we're talking about. And <clears throat> what one has to say, the bureaucratic apparatus which has come into being, has come into being as a mode of control in which it is performing a class function, while at the same time it cannot do so. And I think that's much more what a bureaucratic apparatus is, as opposed to simply an official thing. The, it, it's easiest to see in the case of the Soviet Union, where no one believed in the system, the bureaucratic apparatus didn't believe in it at all, knew that it wouldn't function. So when you had the planning apparatus, the planning apparatus was based on the fact that people were not going to do what they expected them to do, and therefore I had to change it so that it would relate to what they wanted to do, and they knew that the people above would know all this, and they'd also change it, and they'd also adapt, and so on, and it would go on like that, until you got an eventual product which was different from what they intended. Well, <laughs> that's because the society was internally contradictory, and it couldn't change from that, from that position. I think we've been through this many times. Very few people actually could believe in what existed. They could believe in a socialism. They could hope for the best. But to actually believe that society was functioning well would achieve what they were talking about, no one could. <clears throat> Not Khrushchev who actually put forward the concept of communism in 20 years. <laughs> I never met Khrushchev even if I wrote to him. <laughs> um, but I did listen to the Department of Political Economy of the Faculty of Economics at Moscow University, which supplied a number of people to the Politburo discussing Khrushchev's uh, speech at the 21st Congress, and really put forward that program, the Congress for 20 years, and they slated it from one end to another, and then threw me out of the room. <laughs> so, <clears throat> clearly, <clears throat> They are bureaucrats precisely because they're there in order to achieve some sort of accommodation, to hold the line, as it were. And very often, the people in the middle to higher layers of it are highly intelligent and know exactly what to do to see to it that the system doesn't crash. So they change the rules completely, they change what is supposed to happen to something else, and it works even if the instructions are quite different. 
That to me is a bureaucratic apparatus. That was the extreme, of course, in the case of the Soviet Union. But very, variations of it exist today, of course. If you look at the civil service functioning for the British government, the uh, the particular civil servants in the ministries know very well what works and doesn't work. Politicians who come in obviously are effectively uh, uh, part-time uh, workers in this respect and often don't know a thing about the subject. Even if they knew something, they couldn't know what the civil servants know. So the civil servants simply adapt to what uh, they know will actually function at some level, even if they know that it won't really work. And that applies, it seems to me, throughout the whole society. It applies also to uh, production firms with, like, uh, let's say, Ross Royce or uh, Glaxo Smith Klein. Or, uh, Volkswagen. Volkswagen is a good example where you see what happened with it. Amazingly, they actually had a program to deceive the authorities. It's just amazing that you can actually have what amounts to a bureaucratic apparatus in a firm go out to deliberately deceive the world authorities as to what kind of exhaust was, uh, was uh, coming out. But I take it to be normal. I, I don't think that was the only example. I have had the misfortune to have a Volkswagen. <laughs> they, they asked me, you know, when doing some repairs, whether I would uh, buy another Volkswagen. So I said, under no circumstances will I go near a Volkswagen. So, <laughs> because they had one problem after another. Now, the, the point behind all that is that you have a bureaucratic apparatus in firms today which is not identical to what I described but is close to it. Where they know what uh, is expected and what can go through and what can work and what cannot work. That is within a profit system. After all, Volkswagen has to make profits and does so. And within the market, it is deliberately deceiving regulators. And for that matter, it's deliberately deceiving its customers in order to make profit. Some capitalism where it, <laughs> it acts against the interests of its customers consciously and deliberately. Um, <clears throat> I, I I haven't incorporated that quite into a theory of decline, but it, it, it will have to go with it. Anyway, <clears throat> the point here was that I was making a second point in terms of the nature of the, of the transition period, that we're in this <clears throat> period of bureaucratic apparatus, not just in the former Soviet Union or, or for that matter in China, a series of um, countries, but under capitalism itself, within major firms and in the state. And it is operating on a kind of underground planning uh, form, semi-planned form, in order to maintain the system in probably the only way it could be maintained. <laughs> well, um, I think I'll have to leave it at that. I was going to discuss the ideology in the military and further discuss crisis, but I, I, I can't get there. <laughs> I've reached 45 minutes. So I think I've fulfilled the plan. Thank you. <laughs> Talk about uh, uh, capitalism across its various periods, unless there's something in common between them. Of course, it's true. Well, if you look at it, <clears throat> the crucial thing about capitalism, which Marx separates out, is the existence of abstract labour as the dominant form. 
Now, abstract labor in the early period is very, very limited. The question isn't whether um, you can find a particular form in itself, but whether there is a movement towards the uh, towards the production of surplus value, which in the end is dependent on the existence of abstract labor. So you'd be looking at <clears throat> the formation of abstract labor and the, the various other forms in the earliest period. You may not find it. You may or may find echoes of it or some of it there. And it may be a minority and refer to the existence of slavery, which we all know lasted until uh, the end of the uh, 19th century, which was already in a period which we regard as the decline of capitalism. So it becomes quite complex in actually saying this. In other words, trying to find exactly what is in common isn't a simple matter. You can't just assume it. Um, I think all that leads to is a detailed discussion of exactly what is there and what isn't there. And it's just saying that as a Marxist, we can't just say aut automatically X is there, therefore it is somewhere else. Or X and Y and uh, are here, and we, we can simply say they are the same, or they are comparable, or they lead us to anything. They don't. We have to look at the concrete situation and compare that. It's, it's not impossible, but it, it's, it's necessary, otherwise we end up talking nonsense in Marxist terms. Um, yes, uh, you write about productivity. There's no question about it. <clears throat> you said we can go down to 20 hours uh, um, <clears throat> a week. That's perfectly true. Uh, and in fact, that's where we are at the moment in, in terms of the crisis. The crisis at one level, as I was discussing yesterday, is a crisis of overaccumulation. It's quite clear that the major firms could produce many times what they actually are producing at the present time. It's clear that potentially they could produce very much more and sell very much more. It's quite true. It's clear that, let's say, in terms of certain products, the world has an enormous quantity of it. Uh, so there's no doubt that we could very quickly, if we had a social, uh, move towards a social society, uh, move towards at least a relative form of abundance. I think that you're absolutely right on, on that question. <laughs> that uh, doesn't mean, uh, that simply adds the point about um, the uh, decline that capitalism is holding back on this point. You're absolutely right. <clears throat> it's deliberately holding back, and austerity is very much part of that. You're quite right. That it's clear that, that that is the case, and thanks for bringing it up. Um, the question of adulteration, yes, it's true. Now, I wasn't trying to raise the question of whether um, uh, the capitalist class uh, does awful things in, in what it uh, sells. I was simply pointing out that at the present time you have a bureaucratic ap apparatus dedicated to doing it. It's kind of amazing. They're actually dedicated to doing it. Now, remember, it's... Uh, Engels who says that at a certain point the, the bourgeoisie somehow got, to, got together, he doesn't say somehow, he just says they got together and decided they wouldn't cheat each other. Up to then they'd been cheating one another and then they said, well what's the point? Why should we cheat one another? We might as well be decent to each other. Basically he would say. In other words, they weren't going to adulterate in the way they had before, they'd rather produce whatever they were. And no doubt this continued, and you continue, you gave the example of Mark. No doubt that some level it continued, but in general, uh, capitalism and competing capitals have tended not to, to uh, simply deceive their customers. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, They've tried to avoid it, not that they haven't done it at uh, various points, and quite obviously in terms of cars, there's no other way you, you can understand it really, at some level, given the way they actually produce cars which seem to uh, consistently go wrong 
and didn't and don't have to go wrong. <coughs> but <coughs> my point was simply that they have a whole bureaucratic apparatus with, today which is there in order to justify what they're doing or even orchestrate what they're actually doing which is which is a, a change from a, an earlier period that was, that was the only point let's say the growth of a bureaucratic apparatus <coughs> has taken a particular form that's all and I, I, I was trying to illustrate the nature of it um, and, in terms of the actual, again, referring to Mike, in terms of uh, the actual nature of production and incentive system, David Gordon's book, Lean and Mean, is quite useful, bringing out the way they changed. The, the attitude changed between the 70s, exactly what you were talking about, down to the 80s, going over to the market, etc. And the austerity really is the present form. But they were they were doing it in the 80s, 90s, which is what he was what he's what he was describing the considerable shift, which is basically to finance capital, forcing industrial capital to operate in in this way. Lean and mean, they called it. He called them lean and fat because they were fat. I mean, they they did they did well out of it. The capitalist class. Um, in in relation to. Uh, and yes, I, I completely agree in terms of participation. I, I, I thought I, I had said that, obviously, uh, it didn't come across in, in the first bit of what I'm saying, that what was crucial was control from, from below. And unless that is there, one isn't anywhere near uh, talking about socialism or any, trans any genuine transition to socialism is absolutely fundamental, of course. It's we've got a problem with, with the word democracy because of the way the bourgeoisie uses it. Quite evidently, what we have, according to them, is a, uh, is a democratic system, and most of us find that uh, wanting. You can either say it's not democratic, or uh, you can say their their democracy isn't isn't a, a true democracy. You have to find some way around the way they're actually using it, or the way the historians are using it. That's why I just prefer to use the words control from from below. Uh, <clears throat> yes, and it's Marx who says you've got, you can't have a revolution unless actually women are uh, leading it, or, 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 or words to that effect. Yes, clearly um, it's, it's not enough just to have the automation of all the uh, aspects in the home. One has to go far, far, far behind that given the uh, control o over women which actually exists. It's, it's not at all clear what will happen in the social side. I think last time when I spoke to you, you gave a detailed account of feminist theory. So for what I remember, it, some of it implied that there wouldn't even be a home. So, um, but anyway, I, 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 I agree with what you were saying. Which, <clears throat> in, uh, in relation to Ben, yes, it, it is true that Marx was writing at a time when it was possible to write about the material development of capitalism. It was a time when abstract labor had come into being, had truly come into being. Uh, at the same time, he was also writing, uh, although he had written Capital and, and his 25, uh, and uh, it's a tw 25 volumes of notes, what, I've forgotten the number, um, by uh, 1865. So uh, he was, uh, he was all, uh, he, so one could say, he had written all the stuff. But the fact was that he was alive until 1883. Okay, until 1881, he was, uh, he was active. And uh, the decline of capitalism had actually begun, according to Lenin. And he didn't write about it. Uh, whether he saw it or not, uh, we, we don't know. So I think it's perfectly true. What Marx describes is the mature phase of capitalism. He doesn't describe its declining form and doesn't even raise the question. As a matter of fact, in, the, in this famous preface where he talks uh, about, I've forgotten who it was, who refers to uh, Marx's work in a review where Marx quotes him, um, he, he, he says, yes, my work 
does consist of outlining the coming to be mature phase and dying of the capitalist system. He leaves out the word decline. There, there is no decline. It's quite true. So Ben is right that uh, Marx doesn't describe decline. Logically, therefore, one is going beyond Marx in, dis in discussing decline. That's quite true. And uh, it's clear that it's Lenin who actually does it. The, 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 the viewpoint I'm taking is, is from Lenin. It's, it's Lenin who first begins a discussion of decline. It's not in Hilferding. And Hilford in other respects is different also, but it's not in not in Hilford, although Lenin based himself to considerable extent on uh, on Hilford. It's Lenin who brings out the argument on decline, and uh, unfortunately, the Stalinists picked it up and turned it into uh, a a a, a joke by describing it. Um, to turn 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 Stalinism around really existing capitalism <clears throat> to be much worse than it actually was and so made the whole concept very difficult to use but of course it wasn't just the Stalinists it, in general I mean, most of the left rejected the word decline and, and it was possible because it was precisely Lenin who actually began it and began the theory of it. And it hasn't really been developed, it's quite true, Ben is quite right. So it is actually uh, going beyond Marx without question. And uh, yesterday I, I, I pointed this out at one level when talking of monopoly. Clearly, although monopoly was coming into being in, in his lifetime, and of course he refers to the joint stock companies changing the nature of capitalism himself, Marx does. Uh, nonetheless, he doesn't discuss it. It's Lenin who actually discusses it, and it does change the, the nature of capitalism. Uh, uh, um, so, again, it's true that what we are doing is at some level uh, actually going beyond Marx. Uh, ben, is, ben is quite right, all about taste, as it were, but uh, it, was, it was dealt with to a very considerable extent by um, the Monthly Review School, which is why I, I have tended to. Um, avoid it because it's so well known as it were and they base themselves entirely on it and I've reacted against it obviously I've gone much too far you're right I, I sh sh should have discussed the whole nature of waste under under capitalism corruption. and corruption yes that's quite true the, the extent of it um, the, the Baran and Sweezer went into a great deal of detail pointing this out. Uh, I think one of their famous examples was in terms of the of the nature, the cost of the uh, motor car, pointing out how, in fact, uh, they could uh, have, uh, that what they had done to the car. Um, wasn't that great over a period of time and uh, could quite easily have meant that they could have produced it at a fraction of the price uh, from what they were actually producing it at. Uh, they went into great detail showing uh, the different forms of waste within a capitalist society. It's true, well, one could go over that, which would of course um, indicate again that uh, there's a potential level of productivity far greater than what actually exists. So yes, but uh, although one could write another book today since Baran Sweezy's book uh, Monopoly Capital came out in 65, the general point they made is clearly true. You were referring to in Marx, uh, I, th I think is the uh, uh, is in the uh, the chapter in the second volume of th theories of surplus value, as you say, he was discussing Ricardo, and he, he and he he goes through uh, uh, the question of crisis. It's the main chapter in Marx which does discuss crisis. What he's referring to there is slightly different. What he's referring to there, and I did uh, <coughs> refer to this yesterday. I think. In more than questions. Um, Marx is referring to the way in which in crises until 1945 in capitalism the 
crisis would break out, banks would go bankrupt, uh, firms would go bankrupt, cease to exist, uh, <coughs> whole industries will cease to exist. What uh, was called creative destruction. So you get a whole destruction of a section of the economy. Where, as a result, there was of course then, as he put it, forcible adjustment really between the sectors, between top up and one department two, and between department two and the uh, and the consumers. So it was then adjusted. <coughs> Demand supply was then fixed. Uh, there was an interrelationship. But it was, it was done by economic force. Marx uses the term economic force in the Grundrisse. Uh, to say it was done by economic force. I, I think he's referring to that and he's talking about what, what it actually is. But you, you could apply it to the, to the way you were actually saying, of course. It's, I absolutely agree. Uh, <clears throat> In, uh, of course, I, I, I agree with what Yasmin has said, and it's a very important point uh, that uh, Yasmin has made in relation to uh, the way bureaucratic apparatus is stopping the uh, adoption of technique, which uh, looked at from the point of view of the capitalist economy is irrational. I think it's quite true. It's, it's very interesting uh, that's occurring in this period. You could, of course, argue <coughs> that automation could have been introduced 100 years ago uh, by the capitalist class, preferred not to do it because it, it was more expensive than exploiting or super-exploiting workers at the time. It's, it, they'll only adopt automation at a point where it uh, really is much cheaper for them to introduce it because it is, it is costly to introduce and it's, it's both in its price but most particularly in the actual introduction of any new of any new technique it's um, in, in the Soviet Union uh, uh, when they adopted any new technique the uh, whole factory was opposed to it of course because it meant they had to readjust people had to go people had to come the, the plan would then fail, blah, 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 so the thing was hopeless. So they preferred to put up an, a, a new factory instead. Um, that doesn't exist in capitalism in that form, but it's still the case. It takes a long time to introduce a, a, a new technique. So naturally a bureaucratic apparatus is, is going to be opposed to it. What? They can't predict how it will go, what their position would be, what other positions would be, the way the working class will react, the way their supervisors will react. So of course they'll be opposed to it. It's, it's what you would expect, as it were. Though it's not quite as simple as, as I put, of course. The fact that um, in present-day capitalism, we have management by people who understand something about uh, fruit when they are uh, <clears throat> the managers of the National Health Service is crazy undoubtedly. Uh, that, that is the way it is. Uh, um, it's true and I, I have come to know it in terms of the NHS uh, through knowing of or having an argument with somebody who was in such a position. It's, it's, you're absolutely correct. That's the way it's run. It's uh, looked at uh, one level, it's stupid, and from another level, it's uh, inefficient. But it does. The people who were uh, put in place have carried out the government's orders, which was important to them. Yes, absolutely, absolutely right. So, of course, what this is saying is that we're in a in a irrational period and the bureaucratic apparatus is irrational, which I completely agree it is, and the, that is the nature of what it is, unlike what the Weber had to say. In regard to, in regard to Corbyn and Mac McDonald, I, I don't know about Corbyn, but I, I've heard Mac McDonald, of course, on, on TV, and he, he comes across almost um, somewhere on the right when he, he, he talks about the market. I think when he was interviewed by Andrew Marr, he said that uh, he wasn't a Stalinist and uh, he was all in favour of the market. And after that you wondered why anybody would support Corbyn. After all, well, if you're going to support the market, you should support the people who support the market. Like the Conservative Party. 
Well, I, I understand that Corbyn uh, that <laughs> McDonald didn't know what he was saying. I presume he was he was he was simply trying to get it, trying to to get across. But he ought not to have said that clearly. And if he really believes that, there's no point in in uh, supporting him. That's what it boils down to. And of course, it's true that the advisors which he's appointed from Stiglitz onwards uh, uh, are not very left wing. So who knows? But I, I think it is true <coughs> that if they actually do carry out a left wing Labour policy, they'll very quickly end up in direct con confrontation with the capitalist class. If they actually do that, and if they're sin sincere about it, they, uh, uh, they will end up having to do things which we would want them to do. Uh, but there's no guarantee that they will, they will actually do that, that they won't retreat and go in the opposite direction. In, in regard to this question of what I was saying, um, I wasn't arguing in terms of the nature of the party. I, I'm an orthodox Marxist in favor of uh, a, uh, a Bolshevik party, effectively, the, myself. But uh, <coughs> Um, what I was simply discussing was the uh, nature of the present time and the difficulties and contradictions that a Marxist faces when analyzing society and the difficulty the working class faces at the present time in understanding present day society and the difficulty in actually changing present day society which uh, parties have found, found, or which the Bolshevik party actually found when it came to power. I wasn't arguing that they were wrong, I was simply talking about the difficulties which were actually involved, the objective difficulties, which remain, which we have to face in, and we should have an answer ourselves for that, for these problems. That, that, that's all that I was actually raising. I was pointing out that, uh, for instance, in relation to the uh, uh, in, in relation to nationalization, that it's necessarily the case that nationalization within capitalism is going to be less efficient than it would be if it were in a socialist society. And it necessarily will tend to um, perform less well in relation to market entities in certain respects in a market society. And the difficulty that any socialist therefore has in defending nationalization. That was what I was trying to do. Bring out the difficulties that we have in that transition period. There's no point in simply me talking about what is obvious. So uh, I think the point I'm making is that we have to face the problems that are there and be able to theorize as to how we will get around them and how in propaganda terms we can get across to the population as to why this or that failed, why Cuba necessarily had to fail, why Venezuela necessarily had to fail, it couldn't go any other way. We have to be able to explain that and that it's not a failure of socialism or of Marxism or changing capitalism. That's what I was trying to get across. Okay. Uh, Simon? Well, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. Well, <clears throat> one of the features of, of the present time is the way the state has privatized state operations. The most crazy one is G4S, uh, which uh, <clears throat> takes over the responsibility of arresting people and jailing them, putting them on planes and so on. Uh, <clears throat> there's a whole series of operations which are uh, normally privatized to a private firm. I'm not certain what difference that actually makes, except that they're at arm's length and could be even worse than the police. Apart from that, I, I don't know if there's really any fundamental difference, because they are in fact an arm of the state. Instructions come from the state. It's simply that they then paid for a thing in a, in a different way, in a private way. Uh, so, um, the, 
the various forms which have come into existence in the, recent, in the last 20, 30 years of privatization are very peculiar. And they, they do reflect the fact that it's impossible, in fact, to privatize in the way that uh, the capitalist class would actually want to privatize. You can't go back to um, Robert Peel and and before, which is what they would need, for instance, for the case of G4S, which is what I'm, uh, uh, which is an example. Of. But it's not just in that case. In the case of the uh, the other privatized corporations as well, you look at energy, which is just a mess, a completely crazy situation where uh, some of the major energy suppliers are in fact nationalized concerns in France and Germany. But what on earth was the point of privatizing in the first place? You're simply handing over to another country. Uh, nonetheless, the point I think behind that in the case of Britain is that the bourgeoisie doesn't think it can actually run Britain as as the British bourgeoisie. It's much easier to hand it over to a foreign group or to a apparently private group and stand at a distance in order to do what they want to do. Uh, I don't think you can explain it in, in, in any other term. It was the, the denationalization, the privatization under Thatcher was an accident. If you read the economists of the time, they, they in effect say that uh, it was a political decision of the time. Not an ideological one that I'm, although they justified it later, a political decision on the part of the government of the time. So we have today, in other words, a complex system of uh, privatization which isn't quite what it's been. And in relation to um, Volkswagen, as I said, I only brought it up because of the clearly bureaucratic nature of the running of Volkswagen. Now, in an interview on the BBC, somebody who worked for Volkswagen, and I think he resigned, one of the, I think he was working at a middle level, said it was like North Korea. He actually used the term. He said it was like North Korea in, in terms of how it was run. That's to say, a full dictatorial form. In other words, you had a bureaucratic structure run by the, uh, by the top, expecting a series of things to be done. It has, from what he said, it was highly unlikely that that uh, question of the exhaust could have simply come from one person or one group. It had to be much more than that approved somewhere along the line. That's effectively what he was saying. He was saying that on the on the BBC, and I think uh, I think the impression I got was that most people accept that. That was at least partly why the head of Volkswagen resigned. There's clearly something wrong uh, going on. Maybe it's worse than the case of Volkswagen. But remember, Volkswagen <coughs> produces 10 million cars. It's either the top producer of cars in the world or the second top. I say either either one or the other because it, it is both. Let's say sometimes it is the number one producer of cars, sometimes it's number two. The top producer, if it's not them, is Toyota. Obviously it's not just Volkswagen in itself, it's important to Germany. It's important to the employment of the workforce. That is, that is clear. And it, it, it's an important uh, capitalist form within capital as a whole. Well, one can't, can't shut that aside and say, oh well, it just happened. What it implies is that it's possible for a bureaucratic apparatus to do that kind of thing. Now you have to ask, how on earth did the Americans discover it? It seems that the Europeans knew it anyway. That, that's what came out. So, I, I don't know if the Americans discovered it or they were just informed about it and decided to act. The European decided not to act. So, it becomes much more complex in terms of the whole bureaucratic uh, um, apparatus of modern capitalism. You have to ask, well, what's going on in capitalism if that's the way it's being run? But <clears throat> the point I was making wasn't in terms of whether they were deceiving anybody. It, it was simply that you have this kind of bureaucratic apparatus existing. 
It's, it's not the state apparatus, it's the private apparatus. Now, and, and again, in the case of uh, Germany, remember, it's uh, the Volkswagen board uh, conforms to the uh, laws of Germany, and so therefore it has a substantial representation from the workforce, who must themselves have somehow been involved somewhere along the line, or their representatives, in other words. <laughs> So it, it, it goes quite deep in, in, the, in, in the bureaucratic and political structure within Germany itself. Obviously it involved um, the, uh, uh, the government also in, uh, in defending Volkswagen. If, if there really were a, a, um, a, a case of Volkswagen bankruptcy, it would raise the whole question of Germany as a state. It's, it's not, it isn't just any company. Anyway, that's why I raised the thing. I raised it simply because of the importance of uh, modern bureaucracy, and I'm not understanding bureaucracy, remember, the way Weber does. So what I'm saying is it's, uh, this bureaucracy is irrational at the present time at, at the highest possible level if you're thinking of the society as a whole. But it's perfectly rational when you look at what they're actually doing that they are trying to maintain a structure which is in decline and which is very hard to actually maintain. So doing what they did makes complete sense at the present time. Just simply holding the fort as much as they can. So happens they did it that way. Uh, as um, Nelio implied, it could have been done through, through direct corruption, or it could have been uh, fiddling figures in, in a different way, or perhaps uh, paying more or paying less. All those are possibilities in the way they work. The, the point is the way it now works, which isn't a classic private enterprise capitalist way today. That's the point. The bureaucratic apparatus is substituting at some level for the um, the automatic operation of the market, the automatic production of surplus value, stands in between. It's a similar, uh, similar sort of role to what Inelio is referring to, corruption and, uh, and waste. So it, it's very important to understand its whole nature at the present time. And, uh, that leads, of course, to what um, was, uh, was referred to in terms of who actually manages or who is in charge, not just the National Health Service. If you look at the head of a company, you can, today you could have the head of a very large company who knows nothing whatsoever of what they're doing on the grounds that he understands finance. He understands finance, so he understands how to make computers, obviously. And that applies all throughout. You have to wonder exactly uh, how the thing works. And of course it goes further than that. What you have now is a very, as we all know, a very small layer at, at the top in Britain. Uh, in, um, I quoted this before, but in 2010, if you look at income tax, income tax statistics, there were 11,000 people getting more than a million pounds per annum in their uh, salaries and in fact the average at that time was two and a half million and you must have read in the paper they now talk of five and a half million. In fact just a couple of years later they announced that their salaries had doubled anyway. So uh, pretty certain the, uh, the average salary at the top of roughly 11,000 people is five million. Now you can't regard them as simple managers. They are the managers. They are the top managers. Not just one manager, as we're at the top, there'll be several managers in a very large company. So they're getting five million. Well, what does they do with it? Um, for instance, um, Hester, chairman of a bank, he's got uh, six gardeners. In, uh, in Los Angeles, you must have read uh, in the uh, Financial Times, where they gave pictures of it, you have these, these guys, especially building uh, in addition to their house, which uh, provides a lift to take their cars so that they stand opposite their bedroom and they, and they, and they can see them. Yeah. So they can have a few cars yeah. where they can look at night and see them. Well, obviously you're going to get five and a half million. Uh, you have to do something with them. 
So, uh, um, okay, we're, we're at a very peculiar period. Because these are managers, remember, that they may not necessarily have any capital. But clearly what's happened is change, which goes along with this period of bureaucratic apparatus, where the top management has become part of the capitalist class. So you're talking of a change in the nature of the capitalist class. Formerly a manager, after all, can be hired and fired. They still, still can be, but if they're getting five and a half million, you know, within uh, five years after which they're fired, they have over 25 million, or half that, let's say, off the tax. So in practice, they get more than five and a half million anyway. Uh, <clears throat> so we've had a massive change, really, in the nature of the capitalist class, towards, much more towards this management, which management of money and finance capital in, in, the, in, the, in the end, which uh, it does point uh, to quite a lot of what's been mentioned in terms of the mismanagement of where, where they're actually going. And it helps to understand the stupidity of the capitalist class or, or the, of U.S. Um, relations to, uh, to the uh, rest of the world, that these people are extremely influential and it's not surprising therefore that they would have uh, a policy which um, they don't understand in, in, uh, in, in general or support it. Yeah, um, John has really effectively replied for me the, the, in relation to what you were saying over here. Um, I was simply trying to raise the questions of how we can act under present circumstances, how we can understand the arguments at the present time. The fundamental reason why there's no socialist party today is because of Stalinism. Because <clears throat> people don't believe that an alternative society is possible. That Socialism hasn't failed because it hasn't come into existence. I wasn't trying to argue any other kind. Stalinism failed, yes, but that was predictable. Uh, it was quite obvious, uh, and of course I said so for a long time before it ceased to exist. It, it, it was quite obvious when I was living there that it couldn't last. So, um, anyway, it's taken some time for the uh, population to realize that Stalinism wasn't socialism and that there is, an, there is an alternative. I say to realize because the fact is you actually had people voting for Sanders in the United States, something most people didn't expect. That's to say you could actually get a candidate who declared himself to be socialist. Okay, he wasn't a socialist in our terms, nonetheless he used the word socialist. That wasn't altogether a surprise because there were um, opinion polls done in 2008 which were kind of weird because uh, they did say that 30% um, of the US population or voting population would vote for a socialist. They did say so. But unfortunately they also did another poll which showed that 30% of the US population blamed the Jews. So it doesn't, doesn't say much for the, for the, for the population or for, the, uh, or for what that actually meant. So the Sanders vote is, is important even if we don't necessarily support Sanders. So the things are clearly changing. And the, nonetheless, the fact is that it was highly unlikely that the world would go socialist under conditions where one had uh, a, a, an, in effect, anti-socialist regime one of the worst regimes that's ever existed in the world, in the Soviet Union, proclaiming itself to be socialist. And communist parties were following it and declaring themselves uh, uh, in support of it. And there were no substantial other parties so, which were socialist. So it was inevitable that it would take some time. The problem, though, is it's taking longer than one would have wanted or one might have expected for people to realize that socialism is necessary and that uh, what existed wasn't socialist. And secondly, that social democracy doesn't work. The social democracy isn't the solution. People, <clears throat> because after all, the period from 45 to 1970 was clearly better than the present period. And it's taken, it's taken time to understand that social democracy isn't the solution. Yeah. It is changing now, changing rapidly, precisely because of the crisis. And it is a real crisis, and as I argued yesterday, 
there is no end to this crisis so we can anticipate and that, that's a burden of what I'm arguing really we can anticipate change quite quickly now okay okay thanks